Oh, I think I have to do a line there, right? Test, 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 test. Test, test, test. Why is it? Hide that, please. So it's test, test, test. Why is this not working? Test. Oh, that is working. I see it now. Test, 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 test. <laughs> What's that? Oh, moving the ladder. Make pretty pictures. <laughs> 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 Test, 
Test, test, test, test. We are live.
Hi, right, good morning. My name is Matthew Morrison. I'm a professor of electrical engineering here at the University of Mississippi. I want to uh, welcome all of you and thank you for coming out to the first ever Land Sharks to Astronauts Research Program final presentation. Uh, during the course of this summer, uh, 27 undergraduate students, including seven from the Honors College, participated in research. Uh, what I want to talk about today is the program motivation, why it is that we're doing what we're doing, and then we're going to talk about what it is that they accomplished. And then they're going to have the opportunity to actually describe their, inter their, oper their interactions with industry leaders and the ideas that they came up with, what they actually were able to accomplish this summer during this 90 project. This picture that I'm showing here is all of the Land Sharks to Astronaut students, as well as the 16 Heads in the Game High School scholars. One of the interesting things about this program is not only did they have the opportunity to participate in research and participate in getting the interactive industry and grow professionally, but they had the opportunity for mentorship. So my vision for this program is as follows. When I first moved here two years ago, I noticed very quickly that the main challenge in Mississippi is providing quality health care and providing quality access to education, particularly for people in the Mississippi Delta region. Additionally, I found out really quickly that people here love their sports, especially their football. So it became clear to me that any program that grew students' access to education and access to research through love of sports would be a great benefit to the University of Mississippi and to the benefit of those students. And when I started digging into the research, I noticed the challenges with keeping student athletes healthy were the same challenges in rural telemedicine, specifically with the UMC Center for Telehealth and the Center for Neurology, and have this very similar challenges to the, you know, uh, how NASA's human research program is trying to get astronauts on Mars safely beyond lower, the lower Earth orbit. So I came up with the concept of from land sharks to astronauts, meaning everything should connect together. It's an integrated research and education program. And all these are all the teams. Over here we have the, uh, so we got the NASA team. We have our C Fire team over here. We have all the teams working together. And every day, Monday through Friday, they came in and worked two hours on the development of their project, whether it was getting in contact with industry professionals or having the opportunity to ask me questions. Every week they presented a weekly memorandum updating their progress. They did progress reports. They initially started with a, a literature survey, which is typically something that they don't get to encounter either until their senior year or master's or thesis program. They learned how to write professional emails and do professional correspondence. It's really awesome to see how much these students have grown over the last nine weeks professionally, not just in terms of how much they know engineering and how much they know uh, in order to do their jobs, but how, how well they're able to interact. In fact, uh, the medical center was so impressed with the professional correspondence that they got from their team that they requested that the students present resumes and headshots when we drove down there. So they were very impressed with the things that the uh, students learned. And uh, we had a unique opportunity here to work with a company called XC Biosystems, which has the contract with the National Football League and a number of different universities. Uh, the United States Army, the Canadian military, and using sensors to be able to monitor head impacts and be able to provide that information securely and reliably uh, in real time. Uh, this research could not have been possible without our collaboration with the Center for Health and Sports Performance. Uh, additionally, we had a number of interactions with CSPIRE and NASA's Human Research Program at both Johnson Space Center and Glenn, as well as the Ideas Lab and their Game Changing Technology Program. So on that note, I'm going to stop bloviating like a professor, and I'm going to let the teams do their thing. Uh, the first team is going to be the team that got to work with X2 Biosystems. Yes, sir. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we are the X2 Biosystems research team, also known as Team X. Uh, I'm Tarek Siddiqui. Uh, this is Maisha Sadia, Sam Chen, and Xavier Pittman. Um, so to start off, we'd like to go over uh, 
do an overview over X2 bus systems, injury, head injury management system, uh, or the head track system, which it's also known as. Uh, so as you can see, uh, the first, it's essentially, uh, it has three components to it. It starts off with the expat sensor, which is almost the size of a coin, as you can see on the top left. And it's basically uh, worn behind the ears. That's where the athletes are uh, fixed, uh, where this is fixed on the athletes. And it's basically a very sensitive, low power sensor that uh, has a very rapid sampling rate of 100 milliseconds. And it can quantify head impact uh, kinematics in a 360 degree angle, uh, which means it takes in both linear and rotational accelerations. Um, and then we have the next component is the X2 sensor data management app or the SDM app. So the sensor sends over the head impact data to the SDM app using Bluetooth. And as you can see the images on your right, that's uh, it's a tablet implementation. Basically, uh, the personnel on the sideline use this app on the tablet, and it has it documents the player's head impact. Uh, in point great detail. You have the player and team analytics, you have the uh, head impact profiles. You can also do things like assigning the expats to players and uh, setting remove from play thresholds, impact thresholds on, on the app. So basically this app helps with uh, live play decisions. It's uh, updated in real time. Um, the third component is the X2 integrated concussions evaluation app. Uh, this is basically this whole head injury management system is a cloud-based system. So X2, once it uh, uploads the data to the cloud, the ICE app is, uh, can access the info through X2's web page, and this is also a tablet implementation. Um, what it does is basically combines uh, numerous uh, data on athletes for cognitive performance, such as concussion history, orientation, balance, uh, stuff like that to create a baseline for comparison. And uh, also it has these, this thing called sideline assessments, which helps uh, determine uh, remove from play protocols uh, in case of emergent, emergency situations, such as um, loss of consciousness, things like that. And it's used in the NFL, NHL, and MLS. Uh, so this is basically an overview of the head injury management system. Uh, next, we have COAP or the Constraint Application Protocol. And this brings us to the, uh, our main goal for our research over the summer. Uh, basically, X2 plans on using a 915 megahertz ISM radio band network to transmit data. Uh, so what this is, it's a separate network that's separate from your commercial Wi-Fi network, which is 2.4 gigahertz. And that's going to be exclusive for the transmission of head impact data inside the stadium. Uh, so X2 basically plans on replacing the existing Bluetooth transfer system with this. And it, uh, we're going to use the, this web protocol, web protocol, to transfer in that uh, network. Uh, basically, what a web protocol is, like if you use the World Wide Web, you're using the HTTP protocol, as you can see on the far left. Now that's handling a lot of data, or big data as you can see. Uh, what the co-app uh, is special for is uh, especially designed for low power networks. So that means low power sensors in a constrained network. Uh, and how it does that, it, it's basically very similar in structure to HTTP as you can see. HTTP uses very uh, big robust web representations that uh, that handles a lot of data like TLS, TCP, and basically CoAP replaces that, that with uh, DTLS and UDP, which are like more lightweight substitutes, uh, and which that uh, greatly increases the efficiency for uh, data transfer in a low power network and also reduces overhead. Uh, so basically, the big, uh, the, there are a few drawbacks with Bluetooth such as uh, the range is shorter, it's a short range technology, the bandwidth is not very great, uh, there's issues with carrying devices and security, and this will basically help overcome all that and more. 
because it applies this thing called the Internet of Things. And the idea behind it is basically connecting uh, devices to applications in the web or the internet. And for example, in smart lighting, the application of Internet of Things, you can go on a specific URL address and you can uh, turn on a whole room full of smart lights and also change the color of the lights and things like that. So it works in a similar way and uh, basically it serves as a pipeline of data for the head impact data over the internet and allows you to apply web, uh, web technology standards in it. And that gives us a lot of benefits. For example, we can use uh, an authorized login on the network which increases security. We can easily map onto a big internet or HTTP which helps uh, us upload data to the cloud and also uh, access the info on the web pages. Um, and we were asked by X2 to basically send over, run the co-op protocol and send over head impact data uh, using the protocol and we were successfully able to do that. My teammates shall elaborate on this further. Uh. The injury management um, system for X2 starts with the X pack. The data from the X pack is then sent to the base station using the 915 ISM that is industrial, scientific, and medical radio band and uh, using the co-op protocol. From the base station, it is sent to a PC interface and a uh, a Linux board or an NIC board that is the network interface part. We're going to talk a little bit more about the NIC later on into the presentation. From the NIC board, the data is then uh, sent to the Silver Spring um, network cloud to its various access points, which can then be accessed by the X2 system. So, Silver Spring Network is a company that was founded in 2002 in Wisconsin. It provides us with um, cost effective wireless a mesh network also and it has uh, access points all over the country. It, it also provides us with products like um, edge routers, bridges, relays, and uh, NIC cards. Okay, the main uh, advantage of Silver Spring Network was that it provides us with applications that can transfer data in real time, like right as it is happening. Also, it has a very low latency that is the delay period in sending the time, uh, the data, but it's about 10 milliseconds. It also has a very high um, transfer rate of 2.4 megabytes per second. It also provides us with a security by encrypting the data that it sent, which is very useful because we do not want unauthorized personnel to gain access to the um, data that was being transferred. Next time, we're going to talk a little bit more about the link operating system. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about the operating system we are using in our project, which is Ubuntu. So just like Windows and Mac OS, uh, Ubuntu is a Linux operating system. It has Unit as its uh, best cloud environment, and it's generally used for personal computer and smartphone. So why, why are we using Ubuntu as our operating system? The first reason is that uh, Ubuntu has an excellent package management. So uh, it means it is much easier to install and install stuff. Uh, like on Windows, you have to go to the website, download the installer, and run it. However, on Ubuntu, pretty much all you need is just to uh, run, uh, just tap in the sim a simple code command line, and just like apt get install or update, and pretty much everything got installed and updated like automatically. And another reason we use Ubuntu is that. Ubuntu is supported and compatible with TX Sync. TX Sync is the cloud library, which is less in Python. And Ubuntu is uh, has uh, Ubuntu has lots of support for all sorts of programming languages. So it makes uh, TX Sync working perfectly on Ubuntu. And another reason is that Ubuntu is created created by open source developers. So it allows uh, generally like uh, every user to download, run, copy, and distribute, even change and improve their uh, soft software for any purpose and without paying any uh, license fee. So for our X2 team, we, uh, in order to set up all the computers, one as co-op client and the other as uh, co-op server, uh, we changed the code from uh, TX things. 
and the way those are matching. So uh, when we have provided us with a better program environment. And at the end of our project, we successfully transmit data between a client and a server by using co-op protocol. So we were instructed by X2 to um, use the Raspberry Pi and send data of um, about two kilobytes of data to um, use the Raspberry Pi server and send two kilobytes of data using the co-op protocol. So what is a Raspberry Pi? A Raspberry Pi is a small credit card size computer board. It is, um, um, we have a Raspberry Pi that we use. Um, it has two USB ports, so we use it to connect the keyboard and a mouse. It also has an Ethernet uh, a port that we use to connect it to the internet. It also has an HDMI port, so we connected it to the monitor. Um, you can't see it here, but it has an SD card slot. We, uh, we downloaded the operating system called Raspbian onto the Raspberry Pi to use it as a server. So why are we using a Raspberry Pi as a server? The reason is it is very similar to the NFC card that was used. So, um, and also it has a very low power consumption of about five to seven watts of electricity. It is very affordable. It is, uh, this one was $35. So it can be used not only for um, school work, we can also use it for um, hobby purposes. Um, it has also expansion capability. So like I said, it has two USB ports. You can connect uh, other input and output devices or cameras to it or audio, um, info, uh, video and audio inputs too. It also has multiple users. So like I said, we used our uh, SD card and we put an operating system for Raspbian onto it for our server purposes. But if you wanted to maybe convert it into a remote control car or if you wanted to make a video game controller, all you had to do was take in another SD card, put in the required functions and just enter it into it and it will work as your desired option. Next, um, Xavier is going to talk a little bit more about and simplify the whole project for you. Alright, okay, so I'm going to try to put it all this together for y'all. Okay, so you have a TX thing. TX thing is a form of co-op. Co-op is just a web transfer protocol. So you take this web transfer protocol, you install it on the Raspberry Pi, you install it on Linux computer. Now, you will let one of them act as a client, and you will let the other one act as a server. They'll transfer data between each other. The reason why this is important is because it emulates the expat sending data to the designated network. All right, okay, so what Mr. George Humphrey and Mr. David Thibodeau wanted us to do was they wanted us to be able to send two kilobytes of data using co -op. Um, And the reason why they wanted us to send two kilobytes of data is because co op does not stand a large data package or data payload very well. So instead of sending two kilobytes of data, we were able to send 10, 10 kilobytes of data. And the way we were able to do this is by breaking down large data packs into smaller payloads and sending them that way. Um, another goal we accomplished was we, we made a tutorial for CoAP. And then the CoAP is a very new protocol, it's very limited resources out there on how to use it. So we wrote a detailed guide on how to use it that can help out the next people who decide to use it. Um, we also wrote new code. We wrote code to where you can um, import impact data and it'll convert it to a format that's usable, that's usable. And we wrote code that will allow you to view data payloads in different formats. And we got a brief video demonstration. We'll try to go through it and explain you know, what's going on. It's, um, okay, so right now, we're running a server on one Linux computer. And um, we'll open up some impact data and we'll be ready to send it over to the client, which will be on the Linux computer. And this is about 100 entries of impact data. And it's in Excel, and, but we'll send it in another format that will be usable by the time it reaches the client. Sure. Okay, and this is, we're at another computer, and this computer is running the client. And he'll enter the code in, and he'll start receiving all the, all this impact data is came is coming in. And that's viewing it from the terminal. But it also came in as a text file. And that is the impact data that came in as a text file. 
And we also have the option where you can view data payloads through the web browser. And it's the board just to tell you. All right, okay, so right here we're in the web browser and we're doing data payloads. And I think one of them was a power x thing. It'll, it'll push the command for it to receive the, the data payload to say, good morning with an x team. And then it'll try to receive another data payload. And it says, we've learned a lot about COEL this summer. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, to finish up, we'd like to thank some people. Uh, first of all, Dr. Matthew Morrison for giving us this opportunity and supervising our whole research over the two months. Uh, Dr. John Ralston, CEO of X2 Biosystems. Uh, Mr. Jason Thibodeau, who uh, helped us through webinars and teleconferences, gave us guidance. Mr. George Humphrey, who did the same. Uh, Mr. Pat Jernigan, uh, who interviewed, who we interviewed. Uh, at the Women's Athletics and who helped us sort of uh, give us their vision and their expectations for this. And also thank you to all of you for showing up and uh, going through our presentation. Thank you. So next, I would like to introduce our NASA heroes. Those are, those are citations. They can prove they look stuff up. So these are our NASA heroes. Uh, KV Singh, Roderick Rogers, and Travis Williams. Every time I week you change the slide. Good morning, everyone. My name is KB Singh. Uh, I'm Travis Williams. And I'm Roger Rogers. And we're part of the NASA HERO team. Uh, the HERO standing for Human Exploration Research Opportunities. Although we are local heroes, too. <laughs> Uh, and this is our overview slide, uh, kind of going over everything that we've done this summer, uh, our proposed project idea, the RFI that John Charles, Dr. John Charles from NASA just put out, the sensors that we're intending to implement into the heads-up display, uh, the, how we're different from the ideas team right now, and hopefully a long partnership, and also our goals later on down the road. All right, so our proposed project idea, um, we talked to numerous NASA experts, scientists, and engineers, and we discovered that the information astronauts need to know their vitals, procedures, is not really available for them. So we decided on creating a heads-up display on the helmet of an extravehicular activity suit, and, um, and it would be a transparent OLED display. So the beauty of it being transparent is that when they don't need that information, it can be turned off and doesn't hinder them from uh, performing those tasks and uh, doing their mission while, while they're there. And as you can see on the left side, uh, the transparent display, you can see the wall behind it, both uh, formatted to the size of the EVA suit and uh, try to make it a little bit more flexible too. All right, so uh, NASA's request for information. So NASA releases request for information to the public so that, all right. So NASA's, uh, okay. NASA releases requests for information to the public so that experts can produce or aid in the advancements of um, exploration and technology. And these are just like a couple of requests for information that we were able to answer. So the capability to process medical information to support EVA missions, improve real-time measurements during EVAs, ensure crew members can accomplish tasks autonomously, improve situational awareness, and understand key threats and indicators. Uh, this past summer, we've interviewed many different experts from NASA, including Dr. Sarah Swartz, who is a dietitian, Mr. Nate Newby, Mr. David Hamm, Dr. Daniel Barda, and Mr. David Miranda. Uh, 
Everyone else were engineers of various trades. And first off, we found out that during the EVAs, the extravehicular activities, uh, they're not very well monitored. And this this was actually from almost every single person that we talked to. The another big thing that first came up with Mr. David Ham was the psychological idea of possibly a numerical representation on a heads-up display. The numbers might be a little too stressful versus maybe a color-coded system or something else that wouldn't just be in their face and stress them out as much psychologically. We didn't really think about that as engineers. Along with, as time goes on, culture will change because this project probably won't be done for a few years. So the it will be implemented within a few years. And by then, wearable technology will be more of a norm. And it won't be as hard to actually get astronauts to wear or use. And also, since we've kind of found this out from everybody, that astronauts, if they don't like it, they'll tell all the Earth, like the other astronauts, if they don't really like it. And it will not be used as a primary source of tech, along with uh, maybe a motivational incentive that will help them actually implement this and use it and not just push it off as a piece of technology that they don't really care for. We, we found that out from Dr. David Ham and the uh, current monitoring system that they're using during their EVAs is they have a mirror on their wrist that we found out from Mr. Nate Newby that they can look at different displays that are on their chest to see the vitals that they are actually monitoring at this time using biosensors. And uh, a big thing with X2 Biosystems is there's no way to monitor the astronauts uh, coming down in their Soyuz back from low, uh, low Earth gravity. So we're going to use the X2 chip to actually monitor that because a lot of astronauts from Mr. Nate Newby told us that they experienced the experience as a car crash, uh, along with they've lost teeth. Uh, teeth and have had headaches, concussion-like symptoms, and it would be nice for them to have the data when they're getting them out of the Soyuz because sometimes it takes up to three hours to actually find it. Um, and so there's two different types of suits that we primarily will focus on. Uh, the, during the EVA, they wear the extra vehicle mobility unit suits, and uh, that's where we'll have the heads-up display. So the one on your uh, left right there. And then in the advanced crew escape suits is the ones that they use to go up and down from back in space. So that's where we have the X, X2 sensors because of, uh, you're probably not going to get a concussion while in space. All right, so for our heads up display uh, from Dr. Sarah Zortz, we um, figured out that we should monitor heart rate heart rate, respiration rate, respiration, and uh, body temperatures. And then from uh, Dr. David Ham and um, Barda, we also found out that displaying autonomous procedures would help in allowing astronauts to do uh, accomplish more on their own without having to rely on ground um, opera. And also we wanted to look at the environmental aspects of it too. So you have uh, not only monitoring the astronaut itself, uh, himself or herself, you can uh, monitor the oxygen in the suit, the pressure in the suit, and display all that information to the astronaut. Let's say when they're on Mars, they need to know this information. Uh, they know, you know, hey, I'm leaking oxygen. Or there's too much carbon dioxide in my suit. All, all these different measures, if they have this information readily available, they can use it for them. And, um, including the environmental awareness is uh, the picture you see right there is called the PLES, the portable life sustaining subsystem. It had your oxygen, your power supply, other numerous sensors in there that they carry behind their back. So it's kind of, it's a hefty pack that they carry with them. So it'd be really helpful for them to know how much oxygen they have left. And so right here are the various sensors we plan on using. Uh, we have the echo vital sensor that monitors heart rate, uh, other various pressures, the X2 biosystems, uh, familiar with that, just a very nice presentation on that. And then uh, the active watch that implements, uh, 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 attracts, yeah, measures their sleep schedules and other various things. And then the main sensor we're really interested in is the uh, NASA AIMS gas sensor. It's a nano sensor that monitors oxygen, uh, 
carbon dioxide, just various gases, and be very useful for the astronauts to have. Um, it's like I said, a nano sensor, very cheap, and all these communicate via Bluetooth. So we're yes. we'll have a small microcomputer in uh, on board the EVA suit and send that information via Bluetooth to the uh, OLED display and also back down to ground personnel. Uh, Dr. Matthew Morrison went to a presentation conference in Washington, D.C. At, for NASA, and he met up with somebody named David J. Miranda. He's an engineer at NASA, and they're currently working on this project called IDEAS, which is Integrated Display Environmental Awareness System, and it is a type of uh, smart glass technology. So we, we actually got a hold of him and had a conference call and he, he told us that they're having a lot of the same problems that we ran into and how they've kind of gone over it and they've also been working the same management style that we have but there is primarily are for ground personnel which ours are for astronauts and the big problem with theirs possibly for astronauts would be that they're glasses so they could fall off and if they did use a band or something to keep them on their head, it might not be comfortable. And it goes back to the whole aspect of what the astronauts tell the other astronauts not to wear them. Then they, they haven't very openly used biosensors. They've used gas sensors to primarily the nanotech that KB uh, previously just talked about that monitors oxygen and different things for ground personnel and different, a uh, like, uh, I don't know. That's Factories, yeah. that's the word. But they they primarily have focused on displaying procedures, uh, whereas we, we kind of want to give more health related things, but still give procedures because that was a reoccurring relevance that we needed to actually display. But uh, the ideas glasses were actually Android based, which could be compatible with phones or any Android device that actually could make implementation a lot easier. And Dr. Miranda also agreed with a thing that we came up with with David Hamm that there should possibly be a library of different uh, applications that you could use for the display. That way, because some people might want one thing, but another person wants something else. And some things that would be helpful for other people won't be helpful for them. So if they can pick and choose what they want and not clutter their heads up display, it'd be more relevant probably more used. All right, so our goals for the future is to actually receive an EVA helmet to apply our heads up technology. Uh, also, it's uh, different power options for our OLEDs. And um, like Travis said, we would like to incorporate a library of different applications for the astronauts because different astronauts would like different um, displays. And um, we also like to split into a hardware and software team just to incorporate our um, hardware technology and software so that we can get that library situated. And we have a picture of Iron Man on the uh, <laughs> screen because we don't want to overcrowd uh, the astronaut like Iron Man is right now. Instead, we will like uh, just like a corner of the technology, just like this way so that the astronaut can have a pretty good view of like what they're actually doing. All right, and we'd like to thank uh, uh, Dr. John Charles and Jennifer uh, Bartree, and um, also Dr. Lauren Merkel, uh, Dr. Sarah Schwartz, who was really helpful with the data we need to provide, and Mr. Nate Newby and Mr. David Hamm, and also uh, Mr. Daniel, uh, Dr. Daniel Barta for offering the different ideas on how to actually implement this project, and. And we hope to form a long-term relationship with Dr. David Miranda because he's part of the IDSC and we have kind of a similar project. So uh, we'll be working long-term and trying to figure out some solutions for that. And most importantly, we'd like to thank Dr. Morrison for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, we've learned a lot this semester or this summer uh, and, and it'll look great on the resume that we work for that <laughs> All right, next on, next on deck is our team that worked with the Ole Miss uh, Athletics Department. Thomas Garner, Jack Barthel, and Dick Lee. 
Hey everybody, uh, we're the Ole Miss Athletics team. Uh, I'm Jack Barksdale, this is Thomas Garner, and uh, it's James Lee. All right, so our goal uh, this, this summer uh, was to address some of the problems that the Ole Miss football team is facing with the uh, water valleys that they're using. Uh, some of the deliverables um, include increasing the usage time of these water dollies, waterproofing the system, uh, both through the nozzles that the players drink through and the coolers themselves, uh, and improving overall functionality, which includes portability, uh, lowering cost of the system, and uh, various other things. Uh, all right, so some current issues with the water dollies um, that we discovered both uh, through research uh, by ourselves and also through talking with Dr. Melinda Valiant, uh, Mr. Ray Leisinger, and Mr. Lorenz Coleman, who are uh, athletic trainers on the football team. Uh, some of these issues include charging problems with their current batteries. Uh, they're overcharging the batteries, they're depleting the batteries too much, and basically just results and the batteries having to be replaced uh, very often, which increases expense and is also a, a, you know, a general concern for the system design. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, some leaking issues and uh, the poor waterproofing. The coolers condensate a lot, uh, resulting in cooling water below the water dollies. Uh, the battery's low performance. It's a low capacity battery. It's about 8 amp hours, and we're looking to bump that up to uh, about 15. Um, the electrical cording is constantly pulled on by the athletes. Uh, this results in bad electrical connections and uh, system failures. And currently, there's no way to monitor the battery level on the dolly, so you don't know uh, you don't know exactly how charged your your battery is. All right, so as you can see here, uh, this is a picture of the uh, current water dollies that they're using. Um, to the left, y'all might not be able to see that, but basically there's just a giant puddle of water uh, that accumulates over time for these things. Uh, and they have people designated uh, in the, like, during practice to replace these towels and t-shirts uh, that they put under the water dollies to basically soak up uh, the excess water. Um, that's the tank right there. And if, you, if, you, if you're able to see, there's a, a line where the water has condensed on the outside, uh, basically uh, causing a bunch of uh, leaking water freaking issues. Um, on the back of the dolly, which you can't see, but you'll be able to see in the next slide, is the uh, electronics case. Uh, it's not waterproof at all. It's uh, just a, a pretty bad design uh, overall. All right, so this is inside the electronics casing. Um, there's the pump. And there's the battery, and you can see the battery is wrapped with uh, athletic tape, and they basically wrap these batteries with electrical tape uh, once every couple of weeks to try to try and waterproof them. As you can imagine, it doesn't work very well. Um, so if you, you can kind of get the, the general sense that this system design, uh, there are a lot of improvements to be made. Um, and James is going to tell you a little bit about our, uh, our ideas for the design. Okay. Um, since the current water dolly is not working perfectly, so we are thinking how to redesign the new dolly well and which part of the new dolly needs to be upgraded. So here are some considerations. And like, uh, for example, what kind of batteries are we not using and what's the capacity of the new battery and uh, how to improve the waterproofness to prevent the battery damage, damage and uh, how to deal with the water leak, and how to reduce the cost. And the big, biggest question is why are the solar power used in the water dolly is the best price? So, uh, according to those considerations, we came up with uh, our project information number one. After we discussed with Dr. Morrison about how to implement the solar power into the water dolly, uh, we were thinking of building a large solar power supply system and which can uh, charge multiple water dollies at a time. And the uh, output for the solar power panel has to be 310 watts because to charge all water dollies, 20, uh, 240 watt is required, but there are there are two tw uh, 20 percent 
of power law after 11 years. So 80% efficiency multiplied by 310 equals to 248 watts. So even, even the solar panels are at 80% efficiency, it can still provide enough adequate power for all of it. And since only one station is used, so it's cost efficient. But the large the solar power supply system is pretty large. So it will be hard to move around and it occupy a large space. So it's obstructive and it's not portable. And also when they want to charge the dummies, they need to move the dummies to near to the station. So it's also difficult to implement. So here we have uh, project iteration number two, which saw some problems in the last one, which we which is we were thinking of um, build a solar panel uh, charging system for each dolly. So each dolly can is functional with solar power in different locations. And since each dolly has a solar solar power system, so it will prevent over discharge. But since there are four solar panels instead of one, so it can be more expensive. And uh, after we discussed with uh, Mr. Ray Lattinger, we know that they have practice in the morning and also in the afternoon. But between those two practices, they take the all devices inside. So uh, we now have eight devices in this situation, like four dummies and four solar panel system. So it can be no horrible in this case. So here we have a uh, project iteration number three. Um, we were thinking combine those two machines together, which is a, a solar panel mounted on the on a telescope pole on the uh, word dolly. So in this case, the word dolly don't need to be plugged into the mount system anymore. And since each dolly still has a exclusive solar panel system, so it can still prevent over discharge. But since it's a uh, Still, like solar panels are now on the world dolly, so it has poor mobility and the connection parts are prone to breaking. And so it still has six, four solar panels and it's still expensive. And uh, in this case, solar panels are on the world dolly, so the panels actually need to be small. So the output power is not adequate to offer enough. Uh, power to the water daily, so they can only be used as a large extender. So now Thomas going to introduce the final version. So solar panel power is a good idea, but it adds complications to a very simple device already. And in engineering, the last thing you want to do is overcomplicate things. And so we decided that how about we just improve on current devices that are already in the system. So to do this, we've decided to add a larger battery to help counteract uh, over discharging, as well as uh, adding appropriate charging methods. Um, since we'll be removing the solar panels, it'll stay uh, portable and lightweight. Uh, Increased battery size will give us a battery, better battery lifespan, but also a better current use, as well as not having to possibly charge it in between practices. Uh, it's also less expensive. We don't have to consider buying a telescoping pole. We don't have to buy solar panels. We don't have to buy DC to DC chargers for this solar panel. So we're spending a whole lot less, as well as adding a uh, absorbent glass mat battery, AGM batteries, that uh, oftentimes have uh, exhaust ports in them for uh, safety precautions, as well as uh, it's going to be heat cycled to allow it to have a deeper uh, discharge rate. Uh, but some cons of this is going to be is that, you know, they, they will find sometimes they'll probably still in the long run, they don't have to still charge it after practice. 
as well as uh, it's not going to be green energy, unfortunately. Uh, so the battery, what we believe have been some of the causes to their uh, problems of why they've been having to replace uh, parts so often is, is that when you overcharge, uh, batteries can start to form hydrogen gas. And this, uh, over time, begins to degrade the battery. Uh, so after talking with uh, Mr. Matt Lowe, we, uh, he suggested having a bit tube for this AGM battery because you don't want this gas to form inside a container. And it's outside. you got other things that's making pop. We don't want to make it pop. And so, obviously, add a way to export the, this hydrogen gas. Another way to uh, help prevent uh, the effects of overcharging is to have a smart charger. This smart charger will control uh, current rates at different stages of uh, charge. And so this will help lower it and reduce the effects of uh, overcharging. Uh, another reason uh, they could have been having problems with having to replace the batteries is that they're dis over discharging. Over discharging uh, usually occurs, you know, when you start pushing below 20 to 30 percent at extended periods of time. And so, what happens is, is that the lead and lead acid components inside the battery begin to dissolve in the water and creates internal short circuits inside there. And obviously, having to replace them as a result. Uh, there also milky white substance can form on, on the batteries as a result of it. Uh, you can see it in these clear uh, cases, but you wouldn't be able to see it in the black cases. Uh, so to counter this, bigger battery, so to help avoid them actually getting down to those states of charge, as well as adding a state of charge reader, as they don't have a way to actually see right now if it's fully charged or if it's uh, depleted. And uh, there's the model of the uh, dialing that we wanted to uh, make. Uh, it's, so it will include the larger battery. You'll have the vent tube, safety precautions, as well as having a smart charger and a state of charge reader to help them monitor the uh, charge of the battery as well as prolong the life of it. Uh, we'll have a waterproof polycarbonate case, which will help protect these devices inside and on the back. Uh, to help with the uh, condensation that forms a lot, uh, have an insulated sheet, and as well as having a retractable cord on the side of the casing so that uh, they'll have a way to reel it in as, instead of just having it hanging on the side of the box. Uh, unfortunately, uh, due to uh, shipping time and ordering processes, uh, we weren't able to have a prototype to show you guys today. But we do want to uh, give special thanks to uh, Dr. Valiant uh, discussing with her about their times and practices and uh, other ideas of how they run. I uh, want to thank Mr. Matlow for giving us insight on uh, actual design and putting things together. And he, and he will also help us put, it, put the, uh, all this together in the end. Uh, we want to thank Mr. Ray and uh, uh, Mr. Lorandis for uh, giving us this opportunity to help us with work, help help them with the, their problems, as well as, uh, of course, thank Dr. Morrison for giving us this opportunity to uh, be a part of this class. <laughs> Okay, next we have our thinking cap team that worked with both the University of Mississippi Medical Center and with Ceasefire. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, we are the Thinking Tap Research Project Team, and we are a combination of the University of Mississippi Medical Center and Ceasefire Telehealth. I'm Kelly Sitkaff. I'm Eli Carson. I'm Sarah Pyre. I'm Eli Carson. I'm Ethan Mahmoud. Hugh Warren. I'm Ed Warren. And Bert Bird. As you can see, we're very large birds, so we've got a lot of fun stuff. Um, awesome. Thank you. 
So initially we started out as two different groups. Uh, we had a ceasefire telehealth group that our main goal was to focus on developing an app that would help both patients in hospital and at hospital to monitor their vitals, blood pressure, glucose, sugar levels, and heart rate, things like that. So we were hoping to do something with the University of the Medical Center, and they had researched ischemic strokes, concussion patients, and other people who have spent on and need their blood center. So we decided to merge our two groups together to develop this type of apparatus that monitors the sleep wake cycle and near ICU patients. And we met with a couple of different people who have helped us out a lot along the way. Dr. Craig Sparks, Dr. Evan Kelly, Mr. Mitchell Jordan, and Mr. Jason Walsh from Sleep Fire. And that's a picture of one of our meetings with them over there. And Dr. Michael Adcock, Dr. Hannah Sam Lee, Dr. Robin Rockhold, and Dr. Danny Chifani helped us with the university and the that. And you can talk a little bit about our time stuff with them. As Kelly said, we, we had multiple opportunities to meet with some fascinating professionals uh, in their own respective fields of uh, sleep science, neuroscience, telecommunications, and telehealth. Uh, and uh, we had a few opportunities to travel down to Jackson, as you can see in that picture, uh, to, to meet with all of those individuals. Um, they provided us with a wealth of insight just to tackle this, this huge problem and huge issue of, of telehealth and uh, the sensitivity that we have to approach the problem with, with the neuro ICU. Um, Dr. Samuel Lee was our, was our number one go-to neuroscientist. She is a resident uh, neuroscientist at the neuro ICU. Um, it is constantly in there monitoring patients. Uh, she, she opened our, our eyes to a lot of design considerations when we're developing this device to, to safely and accurately monitor uh, stroke patient, TBI patients, uh, sleep cycles, um, she also introduced us to Dr. Uh, Danny Schifani, which who is the, the resident sleep expert and sleep monitoring uh, doctor at UMMC, who also just gave us so much information as, as far as sleep science is, as a, a field of study um, it, where we would place electrodes on the head most optimal to, to capture signals uh, that, that represent deep sleep versus light sleep. Um, he gave us a book, and if you don't mind, I'll read the name of this. Uh, called the Technologist Guide to Performing Sleep Studies, and, and this is the go-to reference manual for performing accurate and safe sleep studies uh, in, in individuals. Um, we decided that we would follow the International 10, 1020 System Guidelines for placing electrodes on the patient's heads. Uh, this obviously, I had to consider the fact that some patients will not be accessible as far as brain injuries and maybe incisions or scars, uh, but what we decided from meeting with Dr. Stefani is that we would go with two frontal electrodes and two occipital electrodes, and that would accurately uh, capture the information that we needed. Um, I believe. <clears throat> we did some research on some different types of personalized healthcare. A few include telehealth sensors, which are sensors that measure basic vitals and track overall health outside of the hospital. Um, this information can be for personal use or transferred to the hospital for doctor and nurses use. This information is transferred over broadband networks. Telecommunication companies such as CSPAR provide these broadband networks, but since this information is confidential and includes patients' personal health records, it must be secure. E-visits are a type of doctor visit where the patient doesn't have to physically go to the hospital. They can do an online chat or an online video chat. This cuts down driving time and waiting time for the patient and eliminates non-emergency appointments to the hospital. It also opens the door for a wider range of specialist access, so patients can connect with doctors across the country rather than being limited to the doctors in their surrounding area. Home health monitoring is continuous monitoring of a patient's health in their home so that doctors and nurses can adjust treatment as necessary. <clears throat> All right, so for the actual neurology neuroscience part of this project, we decided to focus on TBI since we were partnered with the neuroscience. So TBI, you can see up there, is a traumatic brain injury, and there's two different types. We focused more on a closed TBI, which is going to be something actually inside of the body, so a stroke, a concussion, something that hasn't actually protruded into the body. And then an open TBI would be something like if a part of your skull was injured or even broken or punctured 
that's what an open TBI would be. Uh, most of these closed TBIs are caused from a lack of blood flow. This usually causes hypoxia. Hypoxia is just lack of oxygen to a certain region of the brain. Um, what this can cause is a loss of electrical signal through neurons in that part of the brain, which is actually what causes a stroke, what causes a mouth compression. But yeah. Um, so these electrical signals are run off of a sodium potassium pump. Um, as a action potential is being moved, it goes from a nucleus of a neuron. It's going to be passed through the axon, through um, down that uh, axon tube. As this potential is moving, the way it's moving is through voltages. So sodium is going to leave the axon, and it's going to it's going to make the voltage and the electric uh, electric charge go up. As that happens, the, elect the potential is going to then move forward into a new section of that axon. But you also don't want your brain to be extremely negatively charged. So the way that it counteracts that is potassium will then be pumped back into the axon. So essentially what you've got is this negative charge moving through a neuron, and that's how this potential is being passed. And the reason that we have that up there is that's what these EEGs, which we'll talk about later, are actually reading. So um, they're being taken and then being transformed into brain waves on an app. Uh, on that, you're gonna see a beta wave, an alpha wave, theta wave, or a delta wave. Beta is essentially like us up here. We're standing, I'm moving around, uh, I'm awake. That's gonna be a beta wave. An alpha wave is when you're at rest. So sitting down, uh, maybe like right before you fall asleep if you're about to lay down in bed. Um, a theta wave is stages one and two of sleep. So right when you fall asleep, maybe during this presentation, if you got bored, uh, you know, maybe a few theta waves happened. Uh, and then deep sleep is delta waves. Uh, so for delta waves, that means you're completely asleep. You're in stage three, stage four. And the only different wave that we could see that's not on that graph, unfortunately, is an REM. So an REM wave is actually, it goes from stage four and goes back up and it resembles an alpha wave. But what that usually, what that actually is, is uh, dream. And yeah, I'll come up to you. Yeah. Uh, so hopefully there are no theta or delta waves in the audience right now. Um, in one of our meetings with, with Dr. Samuel Lee, uh, like Kelly has already said, sleep cycle and sleep quality is of utmost importance in, in patients who are recovering from a traumatic brain injury. So that's what really drove our approach to develop this this new proprietary device. It would help these doctors monitor patients' sleep cycles. This is something they're not doing right now, and it's something they are very interested in. Um, as Brent eloquently described the brain waves, we're most interested in beta and delta waves. Um, so basically, like, as well as he said, uh, chemical interactions cause electric potentials or voltages that can be measured by electrodes. Uh, you can measure voltage drops from one side of the brain to the other, and it gives you a nice readout, uh, as you see on the right of this slide. Um, we can then take that recorded information and integrate it into a, a proprietary algorithm that takes the peaks uh, and certain high amplitudes of delta and theta waves, and we can combine that information to accurately represent a patient's sleep quality over time, and that is uh, one of our main design goals in this project. Oh, I'm back. Excuse me. All right. So, obviously, when you're so imagine yourself in a very small room, white walls. You're laying in a bed. You can't get up, and the only thing that you can see is a very small TV. It's kind of sad. Um, they, they, that's essentially what you're going to see in most ICU. Um, hospitals and especially the neuro ICU, we got to go visit it. And honestly, it's kind of depressing. What I guess would be an appropriate word for this. Um, but what happens is while they're while these patients are sitting in here, many of them have the opportunity to actually be able to get up, walk around, and uh, rehab these neurons so that they can grow and so they can uh, start sending these action potentials again. However, what's happening is unfortunately the neuro ICU is understaffed. And these nurses and doctors are already doing so much, they can't go and help these patients walk around. So they're essentially laying in bed 24 seven. And um, they're usually asleep about 16 hours of the day. So what that's gonna lead to is a bunch of psychological problems such as anxiety, depression. Many of these patients just believe that they're gonna stay in the hospital for the rest of their lives. They're just gonna lay down for the rest of their lives. And honestly, it has a very, very high effect on them. 
Um, after they are released, uh, these patients that are actually being able to be sent to the hospital floor and then sent home, uh, you're going to see a form of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. This is mainly seen in those patients with either an open TBI or a major stroke, a major concussion, something that actually had surgery or a uh, a major, uh, yeah, surgery, but uh, we'll do the best way with that. <laughs> and then uh, the other thing that you're going to see outside of release is a thing called PICS. PICS is post-intensive care syndrome. You can see it both in the family and in the patient. So in the patient, you're going to see mental health problems such as PTSD, such as anxiety, such as depression, stress, suicidal thoughts even. Um, but for a patient, you're also going to see cognitive damage. They're not going to be able to think as well as they used to, especially for those in the neuro ICU. And you're also going to see some physical damage for those that maybe have had a tough surgery with, with major scarring or an open TBI. And then in the family, you're uh, going to see more of the mental health side, such as PTSD and anxiety and depression, especially because they've had to sit there and watch their family member be stuck in an ICU bed for so long. And they don't think that their family members are going to be out, get out of the hospital ever. It's going to cause anxiety and some major depressive symptoms as well. All right. Um, so before we go into our project, uh, I'm going to explain some related works that we found while we were doing research. First of which is the cocoon headphones. The cocoon headphones is the top picture up there. So if you can look real closely, I don't know, is this the pointer? Yeah. All right. So right there is an EEG sensor. So the cocoon headphones does incorporate EEG just like we would like to as well. And it also incorporates audio. What the cocoon headphones are more focused on is say you're running around, it's going to monitor your brain waves while you're moving, while you're active, and it's also going to give you that sound that just keeps you in a rhythm. Um, the NeuroSky Mind Wave, which is the one that that woman is wearing over there, so the band across the top is strictly for support. There's no EEG sensor. There's nothing on that strictly so that it doesn't fall off. And the main thing that you're going to see on that one is right there. It's a one single EEG sensor right above the eye, which is able to be to, to read the frontal lobe for EEG and then also REM sleep. So it can actually use REM, but um, you're mainly gonna see these patients also uh, moving, active, and then they do sometimes wear it at night, but it's not as much as a medical aspect as it is just a learning aspect for the person wearing it. So you're gonna see this at home rather than in a hospital. And then the final one is the Cognotix Dry EEG band. Um, Sarah and Emily will talk about the sensors used in Cognitive Band in a second, but it uses these uh, sensors called flexors, which can actually read through hair. So just like the others, this is more used for a active type, walking around and essentially learning what these brain waves do, how they act, and why they're important. Okay, so for our project, uh, we have some goals. Uh, you heard Brad talk a lot about the issues that we encountered when we visited the ICU down in Jackson. And so our overarching goal is we're trying to monitor the sleep cycle of patients that are sitting there. It's something that's not being currently done. And uh, a big issue is the fact that the nurses and doctors already have a huge workload on top of them, and it's not. we don't want to add more to it. So we're going to try and relieve the workload off of some of the nurses and, and doctors. And uh, we just want to overall better improve the quality of life in the ICUs. And to do that, there's some aspects that we're incorporating into our peripheral. It's going to have a personal area network uh, and work along with the Raspberry Pi. Uh, we're going to use that plus a personalized app that will be able to measure the sleep waves and then graph them in a way that is easier to read for doctors and nurses and for patients as well so that they can see how much they're sleeping because sleep is an important part of recovery for a lot of TBIs. And uh, we're also going to incorporate a lot of uh, some simulation, mostly in terms of noise. You'll hear a lot more about that in a second. Uh, we're going to incorporate white, pink, and brown movies. That way we can help ease patients into sleep and out of sleep. So this is our initial design. Um, our stage one prototype, as you can see, is a band. And we hope for it to be very comfortable, stretchable, um, 
easy to clean and sterilize in the hospital, so this will be mass on from patient to patient. As Brett had said earlier, we want this to be a strictly medical type of device to really help the doctors and nurses monitor the patient. So we have a band across the top, which is supposed to actually be a support for the EG sensors. The cardionics band that Brett had talked about before uses the drive flexors, which is great for people who have hair, but for patients who you mostly see in the ICU, they have a shaved head with this concussion or TBI. So we're going to be using dry active electrodes, two in the front and two in the back. And the way we want to place them on the head, we're going to have to use some support for the leads that provide support while they're sleeping. It doesn't make the electrodes move. It provides stability and comfort for the patients because while they're sleeping, we don't want things to be moving in the head. So we're also going to have probably four to five sensors, as we said before. Um, the EG sensors will transmit the information to our application and we're going to track the brain waves. So what we really want to look at with the brain waves is seeing when the patients are going into sleep and when they're waking up. Because that will show if the audio enhancement that we're going to talk about is actually benefiting the patient. So we're going to have Panasonic dual amplification headphones that allow patients to amplify the outside surroundings or kind of focus on what they're listening to to create a more relaxing atmosphere for them to fall asleep. We're going to be using white, pink, and brown noise, as Hyper was said to relax the patient and put them into sleep or to help wake them up depending on what state of sleep they need to be in. White noise tends to be a random amount of frequencies of equal amounts of amplitude that usually create a type of buzz or a hiss noise that balances out and subdues background noise so that a patient's able to relax. Pink noise is very similar, but instead of just random types of frequencies, it usually selects frequencies that match an octave, so it makes a more harmonious and melodious type of sound for the patient to fall asleep to. Brown noise focuses on lower frequencies, so it's usually used for deep meditation, REM cycles, delta waves usually, you can see in collaboration with the brown noise. So that's more of an undertone or maybe a hum rather than a high-pitched buzz or hiss here with white noise. And all of these types of noises are also going to be incorporated with an audio experience. So using the application, there's going to be a user interface where you can select a type of sound to listen to. Some people like beach waves, a rainforest jungle type of thing, classical music at an um, orchestra concert, things like that that will help bring the patient out of the four white walls in the hospital and allow them to have more restful sleep. And yeah. Okay, this is more of the sample material. It's flexible. So they have 94% nylon and 6% spandex blend material. They will have braided shielding throughout the circumference of the band to help protect from hormone noise and other electrical interferences. There are snaps to be able to easily remove the leads for sanitation purposes. And then there are slits so you can easily put the sensor screw to connect to the head. And then there will be 18 inch leads that then connect to our Raspberry Pi. And then you can easily put this on the patient's arm and it's um, sizable for different arm sizes. And then it has a, it's a way to keep the leads out of the patient's way so there's no interference in any way with the patient. And as Keith said earlier with the electrodes, they will have two to three occipital and two frontal. And then as Kelly just stated with the headphones, they'll be panasonic, comfortable, easy to sanitize, and durable to patients. <laughs> And uh, I'd like to, to dig into the science of why we chose to include an audio experience in, in this device, not just monitoring sleep cycle, but we're actively trying to manipulate it based on what the doctor deems is necessary for a certain patient to aid in their recovery. Um, there, there's a, a new field of study uh, that deals with a phenomenon known as brainwave entrainment or neural entrainment, uh, and that is the aggregate oscillation frequency that results from synchronous electrical activity and what that what that does is it causes cortical neurons in the brain to actually resonate with a frequency that is perceived uh, subconsciously by the human brain um, basically with these binaural earphones that also amplify the uh, patient surroundings uh, through one ear we can emit a, a 10 hertz signal and through the other ear we can emit a, a 7 hertz signal that will re result in aggregate 3 hertz signal uh, over time the patient's brain waves will actually resonate to that frequency, causing the patient to experience more delta waves, and in that case, to put them into a deeper sleep. If we, if we wanted to bring the patient out of, of a deep sleep cycle to wake them up, we could, we could do the opposite by 
playing something that resembled more of an aggregate uh, alpha wave. Um, so it, it's really fascinating uh, breaking technology that we've, we've been able to experience through working with this project. Um, so as we had said before, we're currently uh, in the design and we are using EEG sensors to monitor these brain waves to make sure the patients are in the proper you know, state of sleep that they need to be in, getting the proper amount of sleep for the maximum amount of rest and recovery. Um, so these EEGs will be attached to the headband, but they will be removable so that they can be cleaned and sanitized. Um, and we discovered that dry electrodes were the best option for our technology because you know, in the types of patients where they don't have open head injuries, the hair won't be ha having to be removed. So that won't be another thing that they're dealing with in the recovery process is growing back all their hair. And so we'll have, um, you can see there's two different types of dry electrodes. The one on the left is going to be the one that's used on the scalp for direct skin to skin contact. And then the one on the right is for through the hair. And that'll be able for, you know, patient comfortability, the best signals that will be received through the EEG sensors. It'll also avoid damage to the skin in the ICU, um, which is a big problem with, you know, these are already, you know, head injuries. And so it's really important that um, they're safe and monitored well. Um, and then these types of sensors will also give off the best signal quality and give us the best results in monitoring. Yes, um, what I want to do is to show you why the first for dry electrodes are considered a non-fluid. Um, based on many researchers and journalists, we compare the disadvantage and advantage of the electrodes. So far, red electrodes that are using conductive shares are commonly used in medical equipment because of its accuracy and dependability benefits. However, we found that they also have disadvantages like they cause skin irritation and allergic reaction and skin contact variation. Additionally, the quality of signal would decay because the conductive gel dehydrates over time during the detecting image sequence. So, due to these drawbacks, we finally considered that the weather flows are not suitable for long-term monitoring and our reality. <laughs> <laughs> okay, when we were in seven which language to use, we came to MATLAB and Python. Python is better to use since we decided to use the Raspberry Pi 3D. And MATLAB does not record in real time data. So our biggest challenge was not adding any more tasks to the nurses because they already have enough on their hands. So that pretty much eliminated MATLAB. And Python has more graphic packages and it's more portable across different operating systems. And so the hospital needs things to be easy to work with, easy to use, and so that was a big plus for Python. And Python has an open source EEG software, which was even better for us. Yeah. What will be done? Through Python, a toolbox called PyEEG will be used to extract and analyze the EEG data. Then a program will be made to graph the peaks of individual EEG waves over a set period of time. This will make a easy to read graph for doctors and nurses, and instead of just reading a jumble of meaningless ways they can understand what kind of sleep the patient is getting and how much sleep the patient is getting. So our future aspirations for the project is we've done all the research that needs to um, happen at this current stage and so our current um, goal is to build a prototype that then will be approved for clinical trials and the um, clinical trials will then allow us to be move our prototype into the neuro ICU to be used on these patients to further their recovery process and better their experience in the hospital. And then from there, it can also be used on the floor in the hospital and then further on to outpatient and the overall telehealth compensation that Kelly will further expand upon. So as Sarah was saying, patients are usually moved from the neuro ICU to a place called the floor which they are monitored by nurses and doctors and they're given physical therapy and assistance because they're not quite ready to go home yet. But once they're in an outpatient scale, 
they don't really receive as much medical attention as they need, especially in rural areas where there's lack of access to health care. It's hard for patients to get what they need. So as we do want to make sure this is implemented in hospitals, we also like to try to get it to an outpatient scale. And that allows us to expand our idea and make it even more interesting. So most patients who are at home have had some hair growing back. They're able to move physically, and they really need a type of intellectual stimulation to make them feel more dependent, basically, and not dependent on others. Um, they're able to speak to other people. So we're going to hopefully develop a game type of aspect to our app that allows for expansion and improvement in basic math skills, grammar, reading, and writing things. And also a type of occupational therapy makes them feel more like they're able to get back to their old type of lifestyle. So we're hoping to incorporate a lot of virtual reality into it. There's been some research going into virtual reality that allows a 3D visual of a different area, a kitchen, your home, living room, things like that, that make a patient feel like the medicine is actually more personalized, like they're living their old life again. And so hopefully we're going to be able to implement these different types of things and expand upon our project. So we'd really just like to take a moment to thank all the doctors who have helped guide us along the way, specifically Dr. Morrison, this wouldn't have been possible without you. Your guidance and support has been definitely unique and very helpful. So thank you so much. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask us. Thank you. Right, last but certainly not least, we have the Cadence design team that uh, worked with me this summer on development of curriculum improvement of labs and being able to eventually implement it in research environments. So without further ado, here they are. Uh, so good afternoon everyone, we are the Cadence Design Team. My name is Simon Siddiqui and my group mates are Adam Westman, I'm Bill McCarty, Aaron Carnahan, James Taylor, and we're working under Dr. Matthew Martin. So the goal of our project uh, is to improve our engineering curriculum by exposing students to real world work experiences. Currently our students graduate and get jobs, but they don't have uh, the knowledge of working with Cadence, design and software tools which is the industry leader in EDA, EDA standing for electronic design automation. Here at Ole we are going to transition to an uh, improved curriculum uh, that will train engineering graduates with key and software tools, improving their understanding of complex course material and giving them an advantage when competing for jobs. So uh, Cadence enables electronic, global electronic design innovation and plays an essential role in the creation of today's integrated circuits and electronics. Cadence software, hardware, IT, and services are used by customers to design and verify um, uh, consumer electronics, advanced semiconductors, uh, computer systems, and telecommunication and networking equipment. Cadence has collaborations with and uh, has their tools and technology implemented by leading electronic industry companies, um, silicon foundries, and IT providers such as Intel, Fujitsu, Samsung, Sony and Texas Instruments, among others. Um, but incorporating data design systems, these companies have produced the highest quality and standards for their products and services. Uh, for instance, in terms of performance, efficiency, or capability, and also managed to improve or upgrade their existing products. In addition to partnerships with exit, um, with tech companies and organizations, Cadence also has a university software program that allows their tools to be used by um, educational institutions around the world. These institutions include software universities in the United States, such as California Institute of Technology, uh, Pennsylvania State University, and so on. Therefore, incorporating Cadence design tools into our uh, course curriculum will enable students to acquire a skill set that is up to date with modern industry standards and therefore make them better fit um, when entering the job market, as I mentioned. Uh, to talk further about the implementation of Cadence tools into the engineering program, my group mate Aaron will speak. Thank you. So the first step in our project was to come up with a new curriculum for computer engineers uh, at the University of Mississippi. Uh, we currently have two of these courses. We have ELE 385 and uh, CMOS uh, BLSI Design. Uh, so 
the, the information we're given is we need to come up with a curriculum that really prepares our graduates for the industry. So as, as you can see here, uh, in 385, the students will already learn uh, hardware description languages. They'll learn to analyze the timing and constraints and analysis of a mixed data path and learn how to apply these hardware description languages and analysis to a real world problem. But we feel like the amount of knowledge they have leaving 385 should be expanded upon or augmented. So we've added extra hardware description languages such as Verilog and uh, Insight System C to really round out and give them the ability to answer any problem they're faced with. Uh, and the next course, which is a follow up to 385, gives them a chance to uh, use their knowledge and apply it towards a real world problem. So here we have a low power digital VLSI design. The X2 sensor is a, an example of a low power system. So these the students can take what they've learned in analysis and, uh, and timing and apply it to a real problem. The, uh, the next class would be a CAD or a computer aided design for computer engineers. In the current curriculum, we have a CAD course for engineers in general. So they learn you know, tools and ways to build an actual engineering product, a problem or you know, apply it. But we feel like we need a course tailored to computer engineers. And this course will be a prerequisite to the CMOS course we already have. So in this course, they learn the basics, like I said before, they learn the basics of skill programming language, which is a language inside of a Persuoso to better use the system. And here they learn the schematic editor and the basic of layout design. So when they get to uh, Engineering 482, they are not having to struggle with learning software. They know how to get around, they know how to use these things, and they can go straight in to solving problems. So Engineering uh, 482 uh, is similar to what it is already. However, we've changed from using a freeware called Electric VLSI, which I can tell you might be the worst thing that's ever happened to you. Uh, so now we're applying these first of us of Cadence tools, which are the industry leader. If a student can graduate learning these materials, there's no reason they will not be marketed. These, you know, we want our engineers to get the top job. We don't want to hear about MIT or any of these other schools. We want the University of Mississippi to be the number one name. And then the final course we propose is electronic, uh, electronic design automation. This will take everything they've learned from their software year in 385 all the way through to a mastery level course. Here they will be using all the tools from beginning to end and implementing them into an overall overarching electronic design automation course. Uh, and then going through that as an example of uh, the differences between the two uh, software we've used, uh, the students were asked in Electrical Engineering 42 to come up with a NAND2 schematic, which is a two input NAND gate schematic in Electrical VLSI and in Virtuoso Schematic Editor. And of course, the one I'm showing you is better, you can barely see, but just take my word for it. Here in Electric VLSI, you, can, you don't see the inputs. These are all your customization uh, options, and it's extremely limited. Not to mention, but you never know when the system's going to crash. Here in Virtuoso, we had to cut off the whole side of the window until we could, but there are, it's extremely straightforward and easy to use. Uh, a student can, after we have gone through and debugged their lab, a student can sit down and say, okay, these are, the, these are the parameters I have. These are the things I need to do, and everything is laid out for you. So to, to go into some of the problems we face and kind of let you guys into our world, uh, James is going to come up and show you some things we've been working on. Okay, so when we were doing the Cadence Labs, we had two different types of problems. Uh, I guess the first type, we had differences between lab manuals and actual working environments. So in this lab manual, this is an example. Um, in this step, it wants the user to select this create constraint in a drop-down menu and then select a diff pair afterwards, which that seems easy. 
but when we would open up the actual work environment and we go do this, um, this window is the same as this window, and you can see that these crate constraint is not an option. You can't select it. So, in a situation like this, we would basically submit a case to cadence support, and hopefully, they would send us back an email. Not always, but um, and basically, they would give you a suggestion. Um, and there's several ways to solve bug issues, obviously. But in this example. Um, he's basically he's basically saying that we need to submit or we need to type in in this line into our Linux terminal to set an environment before we actually open up Virtuoso and go into that particular part and it would pull up. So um, this happened to be a good suggestion. It actually worked, which doesn't happen uh, all the time. And so here is the same uh, picture. So we went in after typing that in, and you had the create constraint option. We went in, select the pair, just to give you all reference. This is this is from the last slide that I was putting on here to see to see the difference. So that created or that solved that issue. So that's the first type of issues we have. Then uh, I guess the second type had to do with library path uh, errors. Um, and sometimes display files, et cetera, would, would not exist. So, an example of that, in a lab, it may have you pull up a layout of some sort, you can go in and edit it, or, or you know, do any, something with it, and the labs are trying to show you how you actually use this, this software. And um, you would have something like this. Well, of course, we would go in and pull up that same layout to get uh, this. These, this blinking white box is basically the program. It's not finding library. It's not finding files to fill in these cells with the different components. There's all sorts of stuff in here. This is a zoomed out view, I guess. And it basically it's it's not filling in at all. So there's either a file that I created, there's some sort of path error. So you'd have to go in and correct that or create a file for that. And Bose actually has a demonstration, a video that he is going to go through how you actually solve those issues. We've uh, prepared this video to demonstrate how to solve two of these recurring errors that we got, and to also give a general overview of a workflow we follow throughout the summer. I'll go ahead and put the video. Here on the left, we have uh, one of our lab manuals open, and then in the lab manual, it's instructing us to open up the schematic. To do this, we go over to our right terminal, and we type the command to open up the Virtuoso. This new window that opened is called the CIW, it's the Command Interpreter window. And this window will display any warnings or errors that we might have gotten when we're trying to run a lab. As you see, all this giant yellow text is telling us that we have a bunch of errors. But thankfully, if you look closely, you can, uh, uh, it will give you an idea of what the problem is and where to look to solve it. And this one particular case, one particular case is telling us that we have library path issues in the cds.lib file. We've, uh, planned ahead and already found this file, and uh, we're going to go ahead and close Virtualoso and uh, pull that up. So we pull up the CDSLib file. This file tells the program where to find specific files located throughout the computer. And right now, since we've already done this lab before, we have two different blocks of code, the incorrect pass and the correct pass. And if you notice that uh, next to the correct pass, we have two dashes, which turns that line into a comment, which means it will not be read, uh, read by the computer. And to solve this, we're going to uncomment the correct pass and then recomment the incorrect pass so the computer will read the correct ones once again. So we paste it there, and if you notice, now we have the double dashes next to incorrect pass and no dashes next to the correct pass, so they will be read. Now we need to check to see if that uh, fixed our problem, so we're going to save what we changed and then reopen Virtuoso. If we did it correctly, hopefully there won't be a giant wall of yellow text. So CIW opens once again. And we can see that we don't have as many errors this time, but we still have one very important error. This display.drf is missing. And uh, this, you might have missed that, maybe forgot to scroll up the CIW, or maybe you don't think it's important. So we're going to demonstrate if we went ahead and tried to open the schematic at this point with that error. So we follow the directions it gives us in the lab, selecting a specific cell. 
then we want the schematics view. So we select, make sure we select schematics. I'll let you guys can see that. And then we have to select our certain version of the software. And the schematic opens, but as you can see, we have, again, a giant wall of yellow text, which means we have a bunch of errors. And all these errors are all related to the, that missing display error it told us about earlier. But uh, luckily, we know how to fix this error as well. And what we need to do is create this missing display error. So we will close the schematic and go back into our Linux terminal and create this display file. So we type the command to create display. Display.drf is what we're calling it. I made a mistake and forgot to type the actual command. <laughs> and then so right now we have this blank document. And uh, we're going to use a virtuoso tool to actually fill it out with all the code that we need. So we go back to the CIW, we open the display resource manager. And then we want to select merge because we are going to take the display files from multiple areas, multiple libraries, and combine them into our new one. So we go through the prompt. We want to select all the files we want to combine. And then we need to set the destination as our new blank display file. So we find it in the browser. And we can follow the prompt, click OK. We're absolutely sure we want to do this. And now if we reload the display file, we, uh, we'll see all this brand new code that would have taken us forever to write. It has information about you know, specific colors, the way, thing, way components look, that kind of thing. So now we need to, once again, check to see if, our, uh, if we fixed our problem. So we'll go back to CIW and open the schematic like we did earlier. Once we get it open, and we can see the schematic opens and we don't have any more errors. So at this point, we can continue with the lab, editing the schematic as it asks us to and finishing the lab. And now uh, Adam will talk about what's next for our project. Um, so moving forward with our project uh, this upcoming year, um, the first class that we'll see these cadence tools uh, begin to be implemented is this three, ELE 385, it's Advanced Digital Systems. And uh, what we'll be doing is adding in, uh, as Aaron had stated before, the hardware description language um, tutorials from cadence. Uh, we already did some of that in our version of the 385 class. Uh, and this makes it much more extensive and will give the students a much broader knowledge of these tool, these newer and uh, more up-to-date types of tools for them to use when they get in the industry. Um, following that in the spring, the CMOS VLSI class will start begin implementing these uh, cadence tools um, because it's a class that's already in place. And following along with what they already do in this class with VLSI design, they will use much of the virtuoso tools and the design tools to learn how to do digital editing and design of VLSI. Um, and once again, prepare them more in a more up-to-date and more advanced fashion uh, than what has been used before. For instance, electric VLSI that is freeware and has been out for quite some time. Um, the other three proposed courses that we have uh, have here will be rolled out within the next few years. Um, the elective course probably being the last of those so that it gives students the time to work through this new computer engineering curriculum fully. Um, or too far. There's a few classes that we have left. Um, uh, these virtuoso courses um, and a few of the classes in 385, uh, our group has spent this summer debugging and coming up with lists of errors and things, updates that could be done in the lab, lab manuals to better prepare uh, students in the future to go through these labs without coming across any errors or issues. Um, so our plan for the future is to go through and continue with all of the rest of the courses uh, in the order that they'll be rolled out in the future so that we have all of these um, this single each single lab happily prepared for a student to sit down with the information and follow through and finish it all up. Um, so we would like to thank uh, Dr. Patrick Haspel, uh, Ms. Cheryl Mendenhall, Dr. Sheila Cahill, uh, Dr. Bish, and especially Dr. Matthew Morrison for uh, making this all happen and uh, letting this project come to be and getting us through here. 
Um, we'd like to thank all you guys for coming out here today. We really appreciate it, and it means a lot. Um, we have a page here with our references for all the pictures that we included in our uh, slideshow. And uh, that's it. Um, if there's any questions you guys have, we'd be happy to answer. Okay, so um, I want to take a quick opportunity here. Uh, I want to congratulate the students for completing an outstanding summer's worth of work. Um, in the second week of the semester, I had the students present what they had done so far to the high schoolers in order to have uh, for the high schoolers to select potential mentors for the remainder of the summer. And uh, there's a lot of nervousness, a lot of people who didn't like presenting. And uh, it's I could fairly say the difference between now and then is night and day. Uh, everybody was outstanding, uh, incredible presentation, very professionally done, and y'all have a lot to be proud of. Uh, additionally, I want to mention that uh, these students are going to have publication opportunities, whether uh, the Cadence team, they're going to be able to, uh, we're going to be going to the uh, Cadence and CDN line, or they have an academic track. We're going to be presenting this curriculum that we developed as a result of their work. Um, Mr. George Humphrey came out uh, last summer with me, and uh, this is the result of this. I should point out, I want to point out this particular slide here uh, for the Cadence. Uh, these are all internet learning service courses. Um, because of what they developed and how uh, the, well, the Cadence team did with developing the lab, uh, the Cadence team has made all of these courses available to the computer and electrical engineering students at the University of Mississippi free of charge. We are the only university in the world that has that, and that is a result of what the Cadence team did. Additionally, the NASA team is going to be uh, presenting their work. Uh, at the uh, Mississippi Louis Stokes uh, Mississippi uh, Minority Alliance for Participation, as well as uh, a submission for NASA's EISD Research Day. And additionally, their work is going to serve as the foundation for a NASA omnibus for their Human Re Exploration Research Opportunity Program, which is why they're called NASA Hero. Uh, we they were able to successfully complete a request for information which we sent to the chief scientist. Uh, our uh, NASA's Human Research Program, John Charles. Um, the uh, C Spire team and the, the Medical Center team are going to be uh, submitting their to the Mississippi Rural Telehealth Conference. Uh, in addition, part of their work is going to be presented at the uh, uh, Southeast Symposium for Computing Engineering Technologies. Um, the X2 Biosystems team, a lot of their work served as the foundation. And matter of fact, every, all of their work sound as uh, the foundation for part of an NSF career proposal that I just submitted. I uh, will have an opportunity to submit through the Broadband Wireless Access Communications Center uh, applications for research experiences for undergraduates and research experiences for teachers in this upcoming year. So one of the great things about what these young women and men have done here is that they've not only done a, a research project that will help them improve in their careers, but they've made a profound and tangible improvement to the curriculum for students coming in for the future, which is a cool and unique opportunity. You should be very proud of yourself for what you've accomplished this summer. Um, I want to go, quickly go through some acknowledgments. Uh, this project wouldn't have uh, been possible without the, uh, some of the people at uh, athletics, particularly athletic director Ross Bjork. Uh, in addition, the athletic trainers have been sure Pat Turnigan and Lorraine Coleman and Ray Leisinger. Uh, additionally, uh, the Center for Health and Sports Performance, Dr. Moore Devalian, and Dr. Shannon Singletary, they are the co-directors of that uh, center. Uh, from the engineering department, I want to thank my department chair, Dr. Bishwanathan, and my dean, Dr. Chang, uh, for being very supportive of me in this vision as I built up this integrated research and education program here uh, at the University of Mississippi. I also want to thank Dr. Daigle, Dr. Doggins, and Dr. Waddell. Uh, for being able to uh, interview uh, certain teams throughout the course of the summer. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Dr. Jim Chambers, who is an inspiration to me in terms of being able to integrate uh, research and education. Uh, Dr. Chambers, for those of you that didn't get to know him, uh, passed away this spring. And uh, he uh, was very helpful for me in my first two years in terms of building this program. Uh, from the medical center, Dr. Sam Louie, Dr. Rockhold, and Dr. Adcock have actually all sent me text messages and emails telling me that the UMC did very well. Um, from XT Biosystems, Dr. Ross, who's their CEO, uh, Mr. Jason Thibodeau, and our intern slash uh, soon-to-be PhD student, Mr. George Humphrey, who's here today. 
Um, from Ceasefire, I thank Dr. Ivory Kelly, uh, Mitchell Jordan, Craig Sparks, Laura Miller, and you and electrical engineering graduate Jason Ball. Uh, from NASA, they had a great opportunity to interview a lot of people. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Dr. Charles and Dr. Fogarty for providing this opportunity for them. Uh, from Wiley Labs, they interviewed Dr. Lauren Merkel, Dr. Sarah Swart, Mr. Nathaniel Newby, and Mr. David Hamm. Uh, from uh, Johnson Space Center Life Support, they interviewed Dr. Daniel Barda, and from Ideas, Mr. Uh, David Miranda. And I also want to thank the uh, chair of the Game Changing Technology Program, Dr. Mary Wuss. And from Cadence, Dr. Patrick Haskell is the chair of their uh, Cadence Schools. Uh, for, I'm sorry, their Cadence Ac Global Academic Program, uh, Ms. Cheryl Mendenhall and Dr. Sheila Cahill. And so on that note, uh, I want to thank you all for coming out, and I want you all have a wonderful day. Oh, yes. Okay, we'll do a group photo. Does anybody have any questions for myself or the uh, or the uh, our experts uh, before before we dismiss? Um, when we talk about the story of the capsule, uh, maybe uh, landing that fell like a car crash, are they still landing with uh, parachutes? Yes, they, they still are, but uh, it. There's no guarantee of where it will land. You have a 75% chance of landing in water, uh, just because they're 75% water. Uh, one of the interesting things we learned is that there are not really that many medical uh, devices within the Soyuz capsule as it's landing. But the only thing that they do have is if it happens to land in an environment where there's hostile people, they do have a rifle. <laughs> so that's their that's the one element of healthcare that's currently on there. And, and in fact, they, they mentioned to us that the International Space Station has less healthcare than a conventional ambulance. Yes. Um, first of all, congratulations on the students that raised up. Um, are there, can you say the students that are being involved with this project? Will they do that? That's a great question. So uh, we have a number of students who are going to be continuing this as part of their senior project. Uh, they'll be working with me this summer. Additionally, uh, Dr. Sammons, who's the uh, dean of the Honors College, was here a little earlier. We have seven honors thesis students who are participating in this. will be working with me uh, all the way with well, rising sophomores to rising seniors. Uh, additionally, uh, uh, Mr. Clay Patrick is here. He was a heads in the game scholar last year. It'll be an electrical engineering student starting in the fall. And so we're going to be kind of actively recruiting heads in the game scholars uh, to come in, be electrical engineering students, and to continue that work. Uh, Mr. Humphrey will be starting his PhD program in the fall. We'll be working actively with the uh, X2 Biosystems team. And uh, Georgia Haggard, if you'd like to come to Ole Miss and continue your NASA work, you're more than welcome to do so. Uh, and so that's, there's a number of different avenues that these students will be able to continue their work. Any other questions? All right, so uh, before I dismiss them, uh, Mr. Larry here wants to get a photo of uh, all of the undergraduate researchers together. And if uh, Clay and Georgia, if you'd like to join us, you're more than welcome. And Georgia, of course. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.